Cool. Thank you. Uh, I guess I should lift this up a little bit. Um, yeah, so my name is Dino Dizovi. I'm a, I call a fun employed security researcher right now, um, or a professional gentleman of leisure with a uh, <laughs> side interest in security research. Um, all right, so yeah, follow me on Twitter. Actually, does anyone follow me on Twitter? It's, wow, this is like almost most of the room. All right. <laughs> it's kind of weird because like, I feel like Twitter is this alternate universe, and then wherever it intersects with the real world is always very strange. All right. Why are we not advancing? All right. Okay, so uh, what am I going to talk about today? Why am I here? Um, I'm going to show what I call the practical applications of return-oriented programming, which is basically return-oriented exploitation. Um, you know, return oriented programming was introduced as an academic paper, um, kind of with a lot of bells and whistles that are not necessarily needed for exploitation, and I'm going to kind of cut away a lot of that cruft, distill it down to what's actually useful so that we can write reliable depth evasion and NX evasion exploits using these type of techniques. Uh, and the point that I'm going to make continually is, um, for the defense side, uh, preventing the introduction of malicious code is not enough to prevent the execution of malicious computations. And I ripped that off completely from the original paper, because I think it's a very great point. And anyone looking at defense systems, um, whether they be operating system mitigations or security products, um, they all so, so often rely on these simple tactics, like attacker tactics that they try and stop. Like one of them is introducing malicious code, which is only the most, you know, the most flexible way to exploit a memory corruption vulnerability. And so we need to kind of expand the box and think a little outside the box. Um, and I'm also going to demonstrate that while exploitation mitigations make exploitation of many types of vulnerabilities more difficult, they haven't stopped it. And they do not prevent all exploitation. So we need to kind of you know, keep that in mind. Every system has its failure points. Um, also, and again on my soapbox about sandboxing and other things about how the multi-user operating system is largely a bad fit for the single user desktop. Because you're the only one using it. But what you want is you want a application isolation security system like you have on your mobile phone. You want that for the desktop, not multiple users, because you really just want you and privileged operations. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today, talk about a little review of current state of exploitation, talk about uh, the new return-oriented exploitation, um, and I talk about how to apply this to bypassing permanent depth, give a uh, in-depth demonstration or an explanation of how the IE Aurora the Operation Aurora vulnerability, how that works, what, how it was caused, and how we may exploit it. And then I'm going to demo uh, my exploit for uh, IE8 on Windows 7 using this technique, which uses return-oriented exploitation to bypass depth, bypass permanent depth. And then I'm going to go a little over uh, my toolkit that I wrote for myself to do this, what I call BISC, which stands for the Borrowed Instruction Synthetic Computer. And then I'll draw some conclusions and stuff. So let's start with a review of uh, where exploitation is these days. So um, the way I look at the, the history of memory corruption and exploitation is it's, you know, someone points out an exploitable case. And then the defense says, oh, we can fix that. And then there's another exploitable case. And they can fix that. And basically, we just keep kind of doing this song and dance and never really kind of backing up and saying, OK, software is soft. You can make it misbehave, and you can get bad things to happen. We need to defend it a little farther back. So the Morris Worm basically did the same cookie cutter um, you know, style stack exploit, or stack buffer overflow and payload that was in uh, Al Aleph 1 smashing the stack. Basically identical. And it was like a technique lost for seven years till Thomas Lopatic rediscovered it. And then, you know, it was, uh, once it got in frack, a lot of people started, uh, were aware of it. And then everyone looked for all stack overflows. And you have a lot of people saying, well, this is the only thing that's exploitable. We don't need to worry about it. And then, Solar Designer dropped some space alien technology on how to exploit uh, heap buffer overflows by overriding the, F, you know, the linked list pointers in heap free blocks. So now we're like, oh, crap. Heap overflows are exploitable. We've got to make sure we get, you know, catch all those. And then integer overflows. And you know, there's a whole ton of, uh, surprise, surprise, in a non-type safe you know, language like C and C++, there's a whole lot of unsafe conditions. And we keep kind of running into the same things. Um, some of the better uh, approaches to this are exploit mitigations. Say, all right, well, we're working on finding all the vulnerabilities, but we won't find them all. And so we may as well try and make it difficult for the exploit developer to get a uh, meaningful exploit. Because vulnerabilities don't own people. Exploits own people. So if you can stop the exploits, you're, doing, you're actually making progress. And starting with XP Service Pack 2, 
uh, micro, you know, main tree operating systems started shipping with exploit mitigations. This included protected stack, protected heap, things like safe SCH, and uh, both software and hardware enforced data execution prevention. This is a, a big step forward. I think the biggest step forward was the introduction of ASLR with Vista, um, which to give you know, credit where it's due, it was you know, invented and first implemented in a PAX project for Linux. Um, and what all this stuff does is this makes exploitation more difficult, and they're sort of additive. As you keep adding on, ah, oh, it's really hard to read. Um, as you keep adding on more mitigations, your exploit difficulty, the time to take a vulnerability to an exploit, or even the probability that a vulnerability can, or the number of vulnerabilities that can be turned into reliable exploits shrinks. And, the t and for those, the time to develop a reliable exploit grows. And what this also does is this basically, these mitigations um, eliminate entire classes of exploitation techniques. So uh, the protected stack, for instance, completely killed the stack return or just overwrite. You know, the vanilla stack overflow, if you compile with slash GS, for the most part, it's gone. Um, so then attackers had the SEH frame overwrite. Um, and then basically you had other mitigations for that. And this is kind of how exploitation has moved forward. And where we are now is we're basically in the you know, heap free blocks, you know, we have protected heaps now, those are kind of out of, out of fashion. And so what you're looking for is application specific data, in particular uh, C++ V tables um, or any other function pointers. And after those get protected, well, you have to figure something else out. And these mitigations, you know, you always have to keep in mind that some come for free with the operating system, some require compiler, um, comp you know, upgrading to a new compiler, and some require the application to opt in. So you won't, even if the operating system supports all these, like you just put, you have an application on Windows 7, you may not have all these. It depends on the OS vendor, on the compiler that the application uses. You know, if they use the Intel compiler instead of the Microsoft compiler, they won't have the same mitigations. And it also requires them to opt in uh, to certain mitigations like DEP and ASLR to kind of declare that their application is compatible with it. And these are additives. So basically you can get, you know, two of the three, but they're real sweet spots in the center when everyone's playing together nicely and you have the most secure app possible. But what's difficult for the end user or for organizations you know, looking at the security of their desktops is it's very difficult to find out exactly which mitigations are one, active, and B, uh, one and B, uh, two, effective in this, in this process. Um, sometimes it might, the application may say it has one of these mitigations, but for one reason or another, they may actually not do anything. Um, and you know, for instance, like things like safe SCH, if one module can, can be loaded that does not opt into safe SCH, that'll allow um, exploitation. And it'll basically you know, destroy the security of the entire process. So this is actually very complex. And so if you look at your web browser, it's really hard to know, like, you know how secure is this? You know, Microsoft gives you a performance rating for your operating system or for your hardware. It'd be nice if basically for your browser configuration, it could say, yeah, you're running at about a four right now. And if you install something like, uh, I'm not going to name a vendor's name or a plugin, you know, all of a sudden you drop down to a three and they're like, yo, you just dropped your security down to a three. I hope that game that you wanted to play was worth it. Um, and you know, so while the operating system out of the box may be pretty solid, once you install any third party software, the security posture of your browser or another, another application may be weakened. Uh, so just to keep in mind, I'm, I'm going a little quickly because I have like 70 slides, so I wanted to cover a lot here. Um, so let's talk about return-oriented exploitation, which is what I call the new hotness. Um, started out with return to libc. This is, you know, again, like most good things in computer security, uh, it was space alien technology delivered to us humans by Solar Designer by way of bug track. Um, this is basically attack was recognizing, well, this is an evasion of the first exploit mitigations, which were non-executable stack segments. And so the idea was, well, we're overriding the return address. Instead of jumping into our shell code, we can jump into existing code. This was code reuse. And so, for instance, instead of executing shellcode, why don't we return into the libc library and return to the function system? So if you're not a programmer, the function system will execute a string using the command shell. So if you call system and bin sh, it'll give you the shell. So instead of returning to shellcode, just return to system with a pointer to bin sh from somewhere else in memory, boom, you have a shell. So your non-executable stack doesn't do anything. And if that's not enough to do it, to get your, uh, to achieve your goals, you can do its return chaining. And this exploits the fact that on x86, your return address and your arguments all come from the same stack. So if you've obliterated the stack and control the whole thing, you control not just the, 